it's an interesting thing to look through the eyes of a child. It's an interesting thing to see these grand and sort of cosmic events that we tend to think about reduced down to a very, very personal level. The interactions between a Jewish and a German boy overlaid against the backdrop of some of those tragic events of Western, Western history. The Boy in Striped Pajamas is a great movie. It is very provocative. It induces a, a lot of themes that uh, we will only be able to talk for a few minutes about here, but we want to raise some of those, partly because I'd like to argue that this is not just a film about the past, but it's a film about the present. And it's also a film that gives us some measure of caution for our future. So let's talk a little bit about the things that we saw in the film. Let me introduce, I don't know if we've introduced our team yet. So Aaron Kleist uh, is uh, right here first, a professor of English. Mickey Klink, a professor in New Testament. Matthew Weathers, a math professor. Tim Muehlhoff from Communication Department. And Paul Spears from the Tory program. Gentlemen, what do you have to say from this film? I think we're all quiet because yeah. it's, we have seen this film multiple times and yet it still strikes us with um, sadness, anger, frustration, that, that it's even hard to begin to, to start a talk in light of this moment of, of objective depravity of the human being shown to us so starkly. And before we, we tackle this from a communication perspective, there's so many things to say from a communication perspective, Nazi propaganda, how your perspective is being socially created, is to sing a song about the vastness of God's love hmm. and compare it to an ocean and then watch that type of evil, you must reconcile the two. And it, quite frankly, from a personal level, that is a lifelong project to reconcile the two. Um, and especially when you have kids to watch that is, it's just brutal. And yet I believe God is loving. I, I believe he's powerful. I believe his heart breaks when he watches that. So it's not a semantical thing to say God is sovereign, but what do you mean by that? And that will be a lifelong question that haunted C.S. Lewis after the, wife of his, uh, the death of his wife. It, it will haunt you, that question. If you don't wrestle deeply with the problem of evil, then I don't think you're taking your Christianity seriously. Dr. Langer said that this is a film about us, and I, I, the first time I watched this film, I was kind of annoyed that they got the accents wrong. That annoyed me. I said, they know they're, because when we Americans make movies, we, we make them so with a German accent, or it's in German with English subtitles, uh, but I think that that was the point, that, that, that they had English accents, or no accent for the English audience, um, because it wasn't about being German, it was about being evil. There's something telling as you watch the film, and we only saw a clip as you're watching, you're seeing the story of, of this young boy, Bruno, and you're connected to him, and you kind of feel, you really, they, the film really makes you connect with him personally. You feel bad for him, he's been moved, he's kind of bored, he's seeing things with his dad he doesn't fully understand, even with his sister, his own tutor who comes in, there's a distance there, and you've connected to him. So that by the end of this film, when you see him in there, you're almost crying, don't go in there. You don't know what's in there. And it's all games for him. He laughs at this costume that probably a man who was killed the other day was wearing. And he's in this room and you, you watch what you just saw and you are so connected to him. And all of a sudden you see this room crowded with people and you spot the one with hair in his head. And that's the one you've connected to. And then you realize that they all aren't deserving of that. There's this powerful moment, at least for me, when I realized the movie wanted me to see an injustice with him. And all of a sudden I realized there was injustice across the board. They all, I didn't want any of them to be wearing those costumes and have the number on their chest. I didn't want any of them to see that. And all of a sudden you begin, like, was that justice for those parents? Was that justice? Is, was that making up for it in some way? There's a potent way that the film, I think, draws you in to connect with one character and have him kind of be moving the plot along as you connect with the injustice this movie depicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would it have been a happy ending if, if the two kids had somehow miraculously escaped at the last minute? Then we'd say, hooray, oh wait. Could, could you imagine that? The two kids got out and only the numbers died. I, I think that's part of why they were numbers instead of names. You could have put a name on their shirt, but it's a lot easier to kill a number. 
And it's interesting in that movie, Mickey's point is great. I mean, when I first watched it, um, I'm thinking about the two boys. <laughs> and they're surrounded by what? 300 other people in the showers? They're somebody else's boys, aren't they? They're somebody else's dads. No, they're numbers. And this is one of the great dangers of allowing people to become anything less than people. We talked about the fact that uh, the, it's easy for us to look at those individuals in the film as numbers, as this story one we've heard so often, it was so long ago. But you made the point uh, that it's a past that connects to our present and future. On the one hand, because we are human beings and human nature again and again, we read the pages of scripture and see ourselves. But it's also one, a story that touches you personally. If you could spend a moment talking about that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Um, my mother was Jewish. My grandmother, I'm sorry, was Jewish. My dad grew up in Nazi Germany. Um, he was actually in the Hitler Youth for a while. Um, and my grandmother didn't make it through the Holocaust. She ended up taking her own life after having a deportation notice to go to the concentration camp come to her while her uh, husband was gone. Her husband was serving as somewhat of a protector in that situation because he was not Jewish and he had certain connections. But uh, it's, this is an event that touches me personally in, at, a, at a wide variety of levels. Um, <laughs> My dad remembers riding his bike up to Buchenwald just to see what was going on there. He knew it was supposed to be off limits. He didn't know why, and he remembers riding up and seeing a sign that says something about this Vertier Scharfgeschoss. And so basically, uh, if you travel beyond here, you will be shot. He didn't know what was on the other side, but that was where my dad grew up. I think we sometimes think this is long ago and far away and would never happen here and now. And uh, let me just caution you against that kind of thought. One of the most disturbing truths coming out of communication theory and its most enlightening thought, oh, thank you. Oh, that was a good communication tip. Um, <laughs> They keep sending us this little note, put the mic closer nice. to your mouth. Yes. Bald men stick out free time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so communication theorists have known for a long time that your viewpoint of the world is socially constructed. It, it is created by other people to show you how to view the world. We see this in advertising, we see it in politics. So um, this child thinks it's fun. He thinks a concentration camp, which to us is the icon of evil, is a place where you have fun. How did he get to that point? There were two huge factors in how he got to that point. One, Nazi propaganda. Nazi propaganda was alive. They did not deny the concentration camps per se. They never called it a concentration camp. They called it a labor camp. And they said it was actually for the good of Germany that the people there, they wanted to reform but they needed to separate them from the public. And if you want to know what a concentration camp really looks like, take a look at the gulag system in the Soviet Union or take a look at what happened during the Boer War. So propaganda, media, very powerful in shaping our perspective. But second, the parents. Um, communication theorists argue that by age five, let me say that again, by age five, by and large, your worldview has already been formed by your parents and by media. So we have got to, as consumers of culture, we've got to step back and say, uh, what is a person's vested interest in me seeing reality in this way? And that's where the works of Foucault, I think, are so important, is Foucault says you need to be suspicious that people are trying to sell you things, and as Americans, uh, wanting to be convinced that the American dream is the, is the epitome of everything, that we need to stop and say, what constitutes being female? Is it really that your thin constitutes being female? What constitutes being a man? If women are sex objects, men are success objects. So we need to step back and say, people are presenting the world to us in certain ways and we need to be critical thinkers. What is the rationale and motive behind your trying to see, have me see the world in a certain way? And I wonder how technology informs the way that we see the world because uh, we look at so much of the world 
through screens, and we saw a clip of that. You know, it's only a mile away where this concentration camp was, but all these Nazi generals come to see what it's about, but instead of going there, they sit in a living room, or maybe even just a couple hundred yards away, and watch this screen instead. And I wonder how often we do that kind of a thing. Uh, I'm not saying if you're using Facebook right now, you're as bad as the Nazis, but maybe so. Wow. But how many of you are looking at my face right now instead of this, or this up here instead of my actual face right now? I don't know. But there's, a, but there's a distancing you're saying. I mean, there's a yeah. technology because of distancing. At least for me, as I'm thinking about what both of you said, and even what Tim is saying, how do we as Biola students, as Christians, create a biblical worldview so that we can see the world through the lens of scripture, the lens of God. Uh, I could spend a lot of time in the Gospel of John and I'm always blown away by the fact in the 14th verse of the first chapter, it's describing Jesus saying the word became flesh. That's a loaded word after what we just saw. That's a loaded word. He didn't say man, didn't say person, didn't say human being or something like that. He used this kind of carcass language. He became flesh. How does that change how we even view this film? How we think about the brokenness in the world that Jesus in some way entered into. It changes the language, I think, as we think how the biblical worldview portrays God entering into this darkness. Him being the light, this being the darkness, and, and how it gives us an, a, a sight to see something in that. Well, and one of the things I think that we want to be aware of is that just like this, the film that the generals were watching, it's an attempt to control our perspective. Yeah. It's an attempt to tell us ways in which we should think. And all throughout our world, we're involved in that all the time. Someone is trying to control our perspective. Our responsibility as followers of Christ is to be able to evaluate the things that we're being told through the lens of the gospel, through the work of this intellectual project that we're taking on at Biola so that we can effectively maneuver through all the blinders that people are attempting to put on us. Mickey just made a great point about the word becoming flesh and uh, I think it was, who was it who introduced, uh, made the comment about the problem of evil? I guess that was Tim at the outset. Uh, one of the interesting things about the, the Bible and the problem of evil is it doesn't really solve the problem of evil in Scripture. And in fact, it seems the most biblical response to the problem of evil is not that God solves it, but that God shared in it through the incarnation, through the crucifixion, and ultimately accomplished through resurrection, the, the redemption and release of this entire world uh, and all the people in it, potentially, uh, to new creation, to a new way of life. But he doesn't really solve it intellectually. He doesn't make it go away. But you have a picture of a God who cared enough to enter in, to share the problem of evil with us. And that's what we offer in the gospel, not the great philosophical solution, but a God who shares and enters in with us. And let me jump in, Rick, with that. And again, the, the interesting thing about Iris that's so fun for us is we push each other. We do not agree on everything. So the statement I'm about to say may be disagreed upon, but in my theological viewpoint, God doesn't just enter into the human condition, but he died for every single person you saw on that screen. That I do not limit the atonement. I believe that Christ died for every man, woman, child. So think about that. We can understand him dying for the Jews. We can understand him dying for those poor kids, but the Nazis who are exterminating the Jews Christ died for them as well. He did not just die for the elect. He didn't just die for Christians. He died for everybody and took that upon himself. What a staggering thought. So our response then becomes compassion for the people who are gassed. But Christ is saying, but when your enemy is hungry, I want you to feed him. When he's thirsty, give him something to drink because I'm interested in their salvation as much as I'm interested in the salvation of the innocents that were killed and, as well. And, and, a good, and the way we would think about the movie, if it were like an action adventure, that's when somebody would come charging through the gates, mowing all the Nazis down and saving everybody, and that would be the way in which we would close it. And then we'd be like, right, that's exactly what should happen. And we would cheer for the people that did that, not think about what was happening to everyone in terms of an eternal perspective. And there is a movie where that happens, in Glorious Bastards, that happens. <laughs> yeah. what? No, I, did I didn't you, name what was all it, what of was, them, but... What was the title of that one, Matthew? Well, don't, don't say it don't again, remember. you're in chapel. Don't, do not say that anymore. <laughs> Great. And it is good to think about that as a 
classic American response to the great problems that we face. I'd like you to think about the last 10 blockbuster movies that you saw and ask yourself the question, was the solution to the problem American militarism? We will come in with a mighty force and destroy the mighty evil, and from the dust, truth, justice, American way, and freedom will arise. Uh, this may as well be propaganda. It isn't organized by Goebbels, but it is executed on a daily basis in a, in a kind of a mind-numbing fashion. We don't even wake up and think, wow, how much stuff did they blow up? We just go, ooh, that was a good one. <laughs> the size of the explosion is important, though. Well, and the colors. <laughs> Slow motion is always good. And, and you think, what am I learning? by constantly allowing myself to be saturated with that sort of visual yeah, image. Absolutely. absolutely, so it's a battle for the mind. Uh, we are, how many people out there, where are my CMA students, our film majors? Yes, we got a few. I'm gonna underscore something that you already know. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that, yes, you might be looking up there as opposed to here, or you know, using technology for uh, yeah, evil purposes, but you are storytellers in a visual medium that can compel uh, our English majors, those interested, well, if you've got a pulse, you're a human being and therefore a storyteller. One thing that uh, Dr. Mulhoff told uh, the Iris group a couple of years ago that stuck with me is that when a story is told well and rightly, the gospel is served. And one thing that uh, may be meant by that is the fact that I, I don't think there's any coincidence that Jesus, when he wants to encapsulate uh, some truths of the human condition in a striking, memorable way, that he tells parables. He tells stories that last, uh, that stick with us. Uh, we know what it is. They cross cultures. People know what, it, you know what the Good Samaritan means. Uh, Storytelling is a way in which we have to connect with the world about in a way that doesn't just diagnose. It is important for us to tell the story truly and say, this happened. This is an aspect of our human condition. But we have the end of the story as well and the larger picture to be able to tell stories that point toward a solution as well. We as storytellers have a responsibility to engage the war for our minds and recognize how others seek to persuade us, but also to tell our story, uh, the story of, well, in which there is only one star in a way that is memorable and lasts and right. communicates well. And I think that's important because our culture, even when someone does well, so we have, um, Tim Tebow, and who's the player for the, the, the Lynn, Lynn now? Lynn on Sanity. The, right, and he's, he's phenomenal, right? But it is, the important thing to our culture is how good both of them are in sports. And secondarily, or third, or fourth, wherever it is on the list, it's an interesting, what, phenomenon that, look at that, these guys are kinda, these are Christians. Well, isn't that interesting? So, let me talk again about basketball, the fact that you were sleeping on your brother's couch for a long period of time, and you don't have really a place to stay, so you're a homeless professional basketball player. Um, but they're really not getting at the important thing. And part of the way we tell our story is to refocus the important thing, not the basketball, not the football, but the fact that Christ is Lord of all in our lives. And regardless if those things are lost tomorrow, we are the same person. And that's, the culture doesn't want to hear that, but our responsibility is to refocus that. Because yeah, I have three boys who play sports, and wa we're watching Sports Center, and a guy says on Sports Center with the steroid controversy, he says this, that my kids are listening to this, if you're not cheating, you are not trying. And I sit there and I listen to this, and they're getting it from ESPN, and I'm just sitting there thinking, you see Which is that? like the gospel of sports. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> You hear that music, it does not matter what's happening. You're like, oh. <laughs> it could be Yiddish shuffleboarding. You know, you don't care. Um, but, but that's the message they're getting. Yeah. You hey, just offended all the Yidd Yiddish shuffleboarders. Yeah, <laughs> Yiddish shuffle. I, I think it's fascinating, actually. Um, <laughs> hey, let me go something, Rick, something you said. Uh, Dr. Langer does a phenomenal job with our integration program. And one of the cool things we get to do is uh, as a faculty, we get to take classes. So Dr. Langer will bring in top-notch theologians. He brought in David Gushy, just this past time, he's one of our top Christian ethicists. Well, Gushy wrote a book called um, 
righteous Gentiles in the Holocaust, and in it defines what a bystander is. Hmm. And it, when I heard him describe what a bystander is, it was haunting. And Rick, you can help me out, but he said there's different kind of bystanders. One, you honestly do not know what's going on. You do, you're not aware what's going on. Second, you're aware what's going on, but you do not have the resources to help. Third, you know what's going on, you have the resources, but it's not your problem, so you don't get involved. That is really interesting when we think about what's happening in Darfur right now, when we're, when we're wondering what's happening in Syria right now, when we hear about the persecution of the church in the Middle East, and we hear about that, we need to ask ourselves the questions, am I aware of the problems of the world? Do I have the resources? And more importantly, do I have the compassion? And where do you fall in those three? A communication theorist talks about being a responsible listener. So when you hear something, own your response to it. It might be, I'm just too busy and that doesn't fit into my plans. But we need to ask God, hey, what, how do you want me to respond to the really evil parts of the world or the needs of the world? Because uh, we are bystanders. In today's technological age, we get a lot of information. What do we do with it? We could uh, say a whole lot more about this film, but we need to wind things down a little bit. So let me uh, start with uh, Paul Spears over there and just say kind of a, a closing comment that you'd like everyone to take away and we'll work our way back, back down to me. Yeah, one of the things I've been thinking about is how easy it is to become captured by the culture. And one of the things that we, I would encourage us to do is to begin to think critically about why is it that I think that this is okay? What is the culture trying to teach me about the way the world is? Why is it that uh, when I look at things like uh, Super Bowl commercials, I'm enticed and I don't think anything of them because I'm not thinking critically? It's, it's an opportunity for us to begin to have conversations with those around us about how distinctive we are and why certain things that are seemingly normal in the culture are not good. And I would tag off of that. We call it reflected appraisal, is I reflect the appraisal of my you parents. You had to use the big word for <laughs> <laughs> Reflected appraisal. Uh, I reflect the appraisal of my parents. I reflect the appraisal of my peer group of culture. And I challenge my students and challenge myself. We need to reflect God's estimation of who we are. And quite simply put, Paul would say, here's the reason you know God loves you. It's not because you're in a dating relationship. It's not your grade point. It's not your financial security. In Romans chapter 8, he quite frankly says, you were worth the death of Christ. According to Christ, you were worth him to endure the shame of the cross, to think little of that shame because he wanted to redeem us. I often think how much easier my life would be if I first viewed myself as a child of God, that God deemed worthy to send his son to die for me, that caused me to relax a little bit when I'm creating my identity in an American culture that puts so much pressure on the externals. And the thing I would challenge you to is to think about the, uh, the screens that you use, um, sort of the literal and figurative. Uh, we interact with many of our friends through Facebook, through technology, and just think about what that might do um, compared to the interacting in real life and the stories that might, the way it changes the story when you receive information through the screen. Because sometimes, the, often the, st the story we hear from our culture is that if you buy the right products, that will solve the problem of evil. There's, there's the answer to the problem of evil is you buy the correct products. Um, so just think about how you interact with technology and the things you see on the screen. We have upon us the demand to respond to the crisis of our world and to the issues going on around us and far away as Christians and as part of the church. What does that look like? I'm hoping that our time here at Biola, yours and mine, will be a time where we wrestle with what it means to be the people of God, to have a prophetic and apostolic role in the world, biblically defined, appropriately defined, that the local church and the body of Christ speaks into this world, and that things like this we can be self-critical about and we can be prophetic about in a world that needs the message of Jesus Christ. I don't know why precisely you were motivated to come today, besides a requirement or whatever else, but this, of this I am certain, the Lord has you here for a purpose and that there is a direct connection between the story that we've been telling and the story that will unfold in your life as you walk out from here. There will be a point where it is unmistakable that the Lord says, here, this person right now, don't turn away. What do you do when that happens? 
you're busy, you've got other things planned in, in your schedule, you've got an agenda, I would simply encourage you that one thing that they would have loved to be certain of is that their story was heard and that it was told and it was not forgotten that there might be change. You have the power to hear a story, to tell your own and give it a reason for the hope that you have. And let me make one suggestion in that regard. This movie has within it a very, very personal element. Friendship, betrayal, and reconciliation. Did you notice that? They, they formed this wonderful Shmuel. Shmuel, what kind of a name is that? They formed this wonderful friendship between Shmuel and Bruno. Bruno betrays Shmuel and he's beaten. And then Shmuel extends a hand of forgiveness to the barbed wire to reconcile. And let me suggest that that might be a good discipline to develop now. Your character is what will enable you to perform well in the moments, the great moments God gives you. The key to an extraordinary life is always your ordinary life. That you begin to develop habits and disciplines like reconciliation and forgiveness so that when the time becomes big, your character will have grown to the size that it's able to meet it. Uh, those things start really close to home with roommates, with parents, with brothers and sisters, with friends. And let me encourage you to be a person who's willing to begin to live the gospel out now in the places that God has given you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.